Hi. Are you boss? Yes, I'm boss. Hi. Julian, nice Hi, to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. You've stated quite explicitly that um, humankind, as it is, um, is not fit for the future, is unfit, which is a kind of dangerous word. Well, it, it, just to take one example, 1% 1 of the human population are psychopaths. Mm -hmm. That means there's around 70 million psychopaths in the world. Now, very soon we'll be able to construct biological weapons in a backyard laboratory, mm -hmm. create smallpox uh, in a backyard laboratory. So you don't need to be an expert in maths to realise there's a significant risk there. But on top of that, all of us are limited in various ways. So people are familiar with the failure to reach a consensus or an agreement and enforce it around climate change or the problems of global poverty and inequality. Humans are naturally uh, selfish, free riders, have limited levels of altruism. So we aren't angels. We aren't, we, we aren't some kind of uh, perfect uh, specimen or animal that can solve these problems. Mm -hmm. That's why the problems continue. And so my idea is that we need to look at human, not just physical or health or cognitive limitations, but also our moral limitations in order to deal with the challenges that, that rapid advances in technology and globalization create for us. A lot of people have an instinctive gut reaction against this tinkering on a genetic level with humans. Yeah, I think it is a basic bias uh, that humans have in favour of the natural. So if you look at the, the people who are against enhancing human beings, mm -hmm. people like Michael Sandel, the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, Leon Cass, Francis Fukuyama, all of them accept the use of science to treat disease, mm -hmm. but they draw a bright line between disease and enhancing normal human beings. And many people have the same belief that we should leave, that there is something especially good about nature. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, really a pre-scientific view of nature and, and the, the evolution of human beings. They either believe there's something intrinsically good in nature or they believe that we're made in the image of God. We're not all born with the same set of capacities. Mm -hmm. You just have to look around. And, and I don't think that's good. And I think if we can change it, we should decide to change it for the better. But many people are very happy to accept genetic inequality because it's natural. Mm -hmm. And and how how far would you go? Are there any limits for you? Yeah, I think there are. There, it's very, this is what the game should be about. It should be about identifying what the ethical limits should be. We shouldn't enhance people. We shouldn't modify them. That makes it more likely they will cause harm to other people. We shouldn't change people that create that creates increased social problems and increased inequality. So one objection people always go, won't this result in Gadiga, a world of, of the genetic elite and, the, and those who are or brave new world? And of course it could. Mm -hmm. It could if you, were, if you only make enhancement or genetic selection available to, to the richest or the most powerful. But if you made it available to those who were the worst off, it would reduce inequality. So how we choose to use this sort of power, I think, is open to us. And for me, I think we can use it to reduce inequality, to enhance the prospects of survival and flourishing over the long term for the human species and the, the natural world, if, if that's what you value. But the challenge is to use, to use values to form policy and not to say natural good, man-made bad. My arguments about selecting the best children apply to in vitro fertilization, artificial reproduction, where you have, you'll maybe form 10 embryos. And within a year or two or five, you'll be able to just test the whole genome mm -hmm. of those 10 embryos. Now, what happens today in countries like Holland, United Kingdom, Australia, you can test for major diseases. Mm -hmm. um, in my view, that's a good thing. I think we ought to select the embryo which doesn't have a major genetic disorder. Some people disagree with that and they have arguments. But in, in addition, you'll be able to select four things like disposition to impulsive criminal behaviour, mm -hmm. dispositions to higher cognitive ability. And 
insofar as that information is there, in my belief, you ought to use it. But in fact, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. It's illegal if it's not for a disease. And this seems to me completely the wrong way around. You're only going to put in one of those 10 embryos. Why not put the best one in? But maybe you presuppose perfect parents. Well, the point is that we already have bad parents. Mm -hmm. The issue is, is this going to make people worse parents? And they're completely independent phenomena. You know, and indeed, I think we should be better parents. We should have parenting classes. We should have parental ethics. We should try to encourage people to be better parents. That, to me, doesn't s support banning selection decisions around. But then the you have to prevent bad parents from having, giving them more tools to be even worse than they are. Well, again, I think the challenge in this area is not to to limit people's access to very beneficial science and, and options. The challenge is to enable them to use that more responsibly. But in the end, if parents have a particular set of values, unless those values are going to cause harm, then they should be free to, to, to act on the basis of those. That's what it is to have freedom. Mm -hmm. So I think that people ought to be choosing children who have higher general cognitive abilities. There's a lot of data that it's better for the child, better for society. Um, do I think parents should be forced to do that? If that's No, I don't think they should be forced to. That's where I think the, the correct objection to sort of Nazi eugenics is that it was involuntary and imposed on mm -hmm. people according to a state vision of how society would, should be. But this is precisely what you do when you say people should not be allowed to make certain kinds of choices because we want society to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. We want there to be this ratio of gay people to straight people or we want this ratio. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's, that's just what the Nazis did, except they had a different view of what society should be. If I said, you know, to you, uh, look, you're, you know, take this vitamin and your child will be smarter, <laughs> You take the vitamin. What's the difference between a vitamin and gene therapy? Both of them act on your biology. That's why they have an effect. The difference is, is two. One is that gene therapy is likely to be more risky. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's passed on to the next generation. Yes. This is much more radical because you can, in principle, create any level of capacity or modification. With genetic selection you're just limited by by what a couple would naturally produce. All you're doing is selecting something that nature could have produced. Gene therapy, on the other hand, can produce beings which could never naturally exist. Mm. So it vastly increases the scope for human modification. Would you enhance yourself? If you, if Me? I, yeah. Sure. In what way? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's too personal a question, but... Um, I think that it would... You know, some people have a high uh, what's called emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have a particularly high emotional intelligence. I have to, I've learnt mm -hmm. how to identify how people are feeling and to, I you know, hope, respond appropriately. But for some people, it's very easy and they feel, you know, other people's emotions mm -hmm. and, and react to those very quickly and, and intuitively. I, I don't think that I particularly have that. And I would prefer to understand other people's minds from that emotional perspective better, but I prefer to be smarter. I don't think there's any, I prefer to be more musical. I'm, a teacher stood me up in, in first grade and said, you're tone deaf, and I never sung after that point. I mean, I would like to be able to appreciate what other people seem to appreciate in music. So, I mean, I have lots of limitations. That I, and, mm. but, and, and you, have, you are a parent? Yes. And would you change something about your children? I, I don't think I would change things about my children. Um, all of my children, you know, seem... Yeah, perfect already. <laughs> perfectly fine to me. I, I would have selected, if I was having IVF, I would have used all the information available in the selection of the embryo. I didn't. Well, my children are born naturally. I don't see why all of this information is there, but it's not given to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, you know, my decision, my child, you know, their future, not the doctors, not the states, not some, you know, individual politician. It's, and, and that information is there. 
and you, you're not given it. How, how would you think about the, the responsibility? Because you say parents are responsible. Would you, wouldn't you prefer not to know in some cases, or would you like to have any every information and choice you can have? Well, I think you should step up and take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you know, people all the time don't take responsibility. And of course, you should be free to do that. So if you say, no, it's too difficult for me, I find it burdensome, I'm just going to let nature throw the dice and I'll take whatever chop. Fine, mm -hmm. you should be allowed to do that. Yeah. But but what I think you should also be encouraged to do is, you know, given the information, say, look, this is, you know, what we know. These are the outcomes that follow these sorts of gene types. Um Would you like to use that? Or we would recommend that, you know, these three embryos are going to have quite, you know, poor life prospects and these three are going to have better ones. Now, you might say, well, I don't, I, I let, just pick one randomly. So I, I, I think it is burdensome. Unfortunately, you know, we're burdened now with enormous power and responsibility and most people choose never to accept it. And I think that's a bad thing. I don't think ethics should always be patting us on the back saying, mm -hmm. you're doing the right thing, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever you do, yeah, that's that's good. I think, you know, it should challenge us. And I think that in many ways we don't we don't even realise that we have responsibility. And when we do, we choose not to take it. Letting nature take its course mm -hmm. is a choice now. Yes. <laughs> in the past it wasn't yes. a choice, but now it's our choice. Say that, you know, the so-called uh, gay gene uh, has been discovered and people can, parents can decide that they don't want to have a homosexual child. Well, I don't think there's any benefit to being heterosexual or homosexual. I don't think you're choosing a better life if you choose either one. So in this case, I think we should let people make their own choice, make allow them to be free. Of course, if everyone in society was choosing homosexual children and there was no other possibility of having children and this was creating great so social problems, that would be a reason to intervene. But we should have a basic... But the other way around, because normally, uh, let's say Russia, people, you know, they don't have a high opinion of homosexuality and I'm sure the parents will think, you know, my child will have a rotten life if if I I allow him to be born or with, the, with this gay gene. How would you defend that choice morally? Well, I think that it's a choice that people have the freedom to make and it's like s sex selection, choosing a, a male child in a sexist society. The solution to that is not banning sex selection. It's not banning the capacity for people to make those. It's the, the proper solution is, is to get rid of sexism and, and homophobia and the social institutions and practices that cause people to choose you know, one sexual orientation or one one sex. Wouldn't so, it be just very liber libertarian, but wouldn't it be just more simple just to ban that kind of choice? Well, I don't think we should be banning choices and, and, and banning people, you know, restricting freedom unless people are harming others. I think this is a very basic and, and, and it's increasingly under threat as certain moralists and certain moral values dictate how we should live. And I think we, we, we're giving up too much freedom. I think the only reason to ban or limit freedom is when you're harming someone. So when somebody chooses a heterosexual child in, in Russia, who are they harming? No one. When somebody chooses to sex select, who are they harming? No well, one. someone may say you're harming a kind of diversity in society that has been there from the beginning of times, even the people in uh, acknowledge it, but you know, you can also create a kind of equalized world in which everybody thinks is about the same, and there are no criminals or not not as many as there were, I and mean, and it's all for the good. But in the, the good, in a sense that it's for for one thing quite boring, and also maybe quite um, how would you say not very challenging anymore. Well, I, I think if 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 diversity is a good thing, then it should be encouraged, and we should. You know, do things which encourage diversity, but we shouldn't be limiting people's choices. Somebody decides how society should be constructed or what level of diversity, and they say, oh, so we're going to regulate your choices on the basis of our idea of what the best kind of diversity is. Mm. I have sympathy with preventing choices when they cause significant social harm. So I don't think people should be free to choose an embryo with a disposition to psychopathy. I think mm. that's a choice we shouldn't... Because that will result in direct harm to other people. Hair colour, eye colour, 
it's not the state's business to be intervening at that level, and and nor even the sex of the child, unless there is a significant gender bias, a gender inequality in the sex ratio in society. If you've got six males to five females, as is the case in some parts of India and China, that's a reason mm -hmm. to restrict freedom. But, you know, in Holland, a few people choosing to have a boy because they've got two girls or a girl because they've got two boys is not the sort of thing we should be you know, preventing through the force of law because we have some idea about how Dutch society should be. You can massively increase this selection for, for genes because at the moment you only produce 10 or 20 embryos. So actually you can only choose for a very small number of, of genes. If you have 100,000 embryos, then you can start to make selections over many, many more different genes. So you could be having not just the child that naturally you'd produce, but one that you would be very unlikely except over many hundreds of lifetimes to produce. So this means that you could have quite significantly genetically advantaged children. Importantly, natural reproduction is pretty bad. It's pretty, it's ineffective and unsafe. Only about one in five embryos produced naturally go on to produce a baby. The rest die out very early on after conception because of major abnormalities. And secondly, of those that are born, 5% of them are abnormal. 5% of babies are, are, are abnormal. So natural reproduction is inefficient and unsafe. It, it won't be very long before artificial reproduction has much better figures than natural reproduction. So the move to a much greater use of artificial reproduction is inevitable just because natural reproduction is so bad. Another objection would be that people would be completely calculating about everything and uh, would not would it would take the surprise out of life itself. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to give you a pearl now. We calculate when we choose our mate. And in fact, that's one of the deepest sort of eugenic selections that human beings make. They choose their mate according partly to the sort of offspring that they want to have. Now, maybe that's a bad thing. I once had this case of what I called the reproduction lottery. Mm -hmm. You might think that we're too calculating. So what we should all do is have children by IVF and those embryos go into a big pool and we always get somebody else's embryo. So we never have our own genetically related child. This would equalise... Mm -hmm. the sort of correlation between genetic privilege and social privilege and would make us less calculating because we wouldn't be able to calculate what our children were going to be like at all. Maybe that's a better world than the... Maybe we're too calculating at the moment. I don't think we are. I think more calculatingness could be a good thing. But we can't just assume that what we have now is somehow matched to our values and what we ought to be aiming at because it's just the production of brute evolution. You seem to be quite optimistic about how humans will handle all these new technologies. No, no, I'm very pessimistic. Oh, so I, I think it's all going to end badly. Oh, I see. <laughs> but I, I see think the only it. hope that we have is to try to avoid that. So this is and our last chance. And business as usual will we'll end up quite bad. Okay. So I, I think that I'm not at all optimistic, but I think the only thing we have going for us is not our enormous cognitive capacity that's generated our science. In many ways, that could be our undoing. What we have going for us is the capacity to decide between good and bad. Mm. And we have to take that a lot more seriously than we have so far because that's the only thing that's going to get us out of this dilemma. Do I think that we will get out of it? No, I don't. <laughs> But I, I don't think leaving it to the market is going to solve the problem, which is what people basically think. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs>